Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, and then Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 1. I'm going to read two portions today. Matthew 7 is our anchor text for this sermon series. We're calling it Jesus 2020, the state of the kingdom. We recognize that our political allegiance is not towards one party, but Jesus is a leadership. And with that, we believe that through no matter what happens as a nation, Jesus is the one we follow. And what we notice is there's this inaugural address he gives, a state of the kingdom. It's actually a political stance he takes in Matthew chapter 5, verse through 7, which is referred to as Sermon on the Mount. So kind of the capstone of this sermon is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. And we're using that kind of as the backdrop as we share different portions of this. So I'll read this and then we'll pray one more time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27 says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who's built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew. And beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. This morning after I pray, I'm going to share for about 15, 20 minutes here. And then uh, my good friend Ravon Calderon will be taking on the other half of the message. So get ready. Uh, she's dusting off that preaching gift. You did not know. She's like a secret agent. She was a, uh, a full-time preacher at one point. And so we're excited for her to share this morning. But let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it's alive and well. It's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And as we, as we handle this moment right now, we say, Holy Spirit, lead and guide your church. Would you lead and guide your people this morning? Would you open up our hearts? Would you prepare our hearts to receive the word that you have intended, the rhema, the living word for now? And God, we ask for your healing power to flow. Lord, I'm grateful for the testimony Bob has shared. Lord, let that take place in the nation here of America. God, I'm contending and believing for miracles we've prayed for for years. That, God, we would see them come to pass with signs and wonders and power. And this morning, for those that are watching online or that are here in need of healing, God, we ask, would you move in power right now? Just again, wherever you're at, seated. If you say, you know what, right now I'm in need of physical healing. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we declare in Jesus' name, sickness go. Pain leave. Restoration of the body take place in a profound way that God you would do a work that only you can it would be marked by a moment of now of you visiting them with your presence and power those watching online heal them restore them the hips would come into alignment the lower backs that are in pain and spasming right now would be completely restored to strength God come and have your way in Jesus name everybody said amen to the person next to you socially distanced and say God's got this God's got this I used to love home improvement television. Not in reference to the 90s show. However, it was great with Tim the Tool Man. But home improvement television meaning like extreme home makeover. Chip and Joanna Gaines, are you with me? Used to is the operative word. Because did you ever watch those shows how they have this insurmountable task that's about to take place. And it's done in 72 hours and on budget. It's this fantasy that's created that if everybody just worked together, it would get done in a timely manner until you actually engage in a home improvement project. That never is on time and is always over budget. And I learned this firsthand in 2016 when we had the opportunity to buy a home that had two units on the property. The back unit was built in 1915, and we're going to use it as missionary housing and a transitional house for those that were trying to save money to buy a home for themselves. So as we buy this property and we now have this new home improvement project, the problem with the house was this. It had a failed foundation where the front part of it was literally at a 30-degree slope. I shared a couple weeks ago about this painful process where we actually had a contractor come in, open up the whole front half, and abandon the project halfway through. 
So we now had this home that was in compromise and was exposed to the elements right as rain season was about to begin. So we had to tarp it up and fix it. A friend of mine named Bob Wilker came around and prepped the outside. Well, I brought a specialist in. I said, well, help us understand what we need to do to get this foundation fixed. And my friend came in and looked at this property and said, hey, you know, I've never seen this before. But the main reason the entire foundation did not fall is because the king's stud was built on a rock, literally. They had brought granite rocks from Rockland back in the early 1900s and built this foundation on true stone. However, the addition that was made was made in a compromised way. So when rain came, literally, it swept the foundation from underneath. So as we brought various specialists in, I finally called a, a favor into my friend that's a general contractor of commercial properties named Michael January, if anybody remembers him back in the day from the Rock of Rockland. So Mike comes over, looks at this and says, you know, I don't do these types of things, but for you, I'll make it happen. I have one friend that is a specialist, concrete specialist. He has a giant crew. He's the kind of guy that pours like freeways and giant, you know, buildings. He's going to come in. He's going to help you. But here's the deal. When you get the call, you be ready the next day. It was like a mafia deal. You know, like when you get the call, you better be ready. So it was a Monday night. I get the call that they're going to be there the next morning. 6 a.m., they knock on my door, and there's a crew of 30 men outside. And as they're there, they're prepping for their day. So he's giving them all the orders. It was just literally like watching somebody dictate to the military. And he's sending different teams off. Well, part of his crew stayed back. And so they began to jackhammer this foundation out. Do we have a picture of just the different work that was done there? So they began to jackhammer out this foundation process. As they're there ripping it out, it finally reaches one point. You see right by that step at the bottom where they stopped. The crew stopped. And the, the guy comes. I mean, I just love old school construction guys that have that old school strength. You know what I'm talking about? And he says, get underneath that house. And they're like, we're afraid it's going to fall on us. You know, again, they're conversing in Spanish. Uh, he then uses some phrases that are not safe for this congregation. It says, give me the jackhammer. And this giant man takes this jackhammer, crawls underneath that house, and with one arm, jackhammers the last bit of the foundation. Fearless. I mean, absolutely fearless. As they get there, they pour the foundation. It's now repaired and literally is brought up to the right degree and right angle. He says, I know why your foundation failed. I said, what's that? He says, come look at this pile. He pulled, oh, this up this pile. Do we have this next picture? He's like, see all that metal right there? They used that because they thought it would strengthen the foundation. It actually compromised it. You know you're living in a biblical parable at this moment. He said they put things in, support structures they thought would strengthen the foundation. But absolutely left it compromised. See, when you say yes to Jesus, you engage in a reconstruction process. You engage in a process of restoring a broken foundation. If you ever come to the illusion or idea that when you say yes to Jesus, you don't need a lot of repair, get ready for a brutal exercise and undertaking. And guess what? It's never on time, and it's incredibly costly. Was it paid for at the cross? Yes. But the cost of discipleship is your life. And so what Jesus does is he comes in, and he starts to remove all those things underneath the surface that you built your life on. Those faulty things, those traumas, those hollow successes. And he removes them away and embraces a life of discipleship. And that foundation is a cross. And it's hard and it's painful. But that's the journey that Jesus invites us into. And what we notice with the Sermon on the Mount is he's reorienting his entire church, his ecclesia. That's where we get this term from. You won't find the term church used very often in the New Testament. But Matthew 16 really sets the stage. There's these called out ones, this living, breathing entity called this ecclesia, this church. And Jesus is forming it of these disciples that are not qualified. And what he does is he calls his disciples forward. There's hundreds that listen. And here's what's important when you read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, is that this is not just the Sermon on the Mount, it's a Sermon on the Mount. What is most likely happened is Jesus gave sermons on the Mount, multiples of them. And Matthew's reciting a collective or holistic teaching of these various inaugural addresses that the Messiah is making.
So in Matthew 5, verse 1, we have the famous passage of the Beatitudes, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, how it's reorienting what blessing is to a position of privilege in the kingdom. And then uh, Sean did a great job with salt and light, which is the responsibility of the Messiah's church, his ecclesia, to live out the responsibility inside this new kingdom. We then have these unique phrases that people get really hung up on, where you have Jesus give six You've heard it say, but now I say unto you passages. You guys ever read that before? People get really confused as, what is this? Is this new scripture? No, what Jesus is doing is he's reinterpreting the Torah where it's been misused by the rabbis of the day. Where the religious spirits come in and he has six distinct interpretations where they have flipped them so that they can have a greater influence in culture by fulfilling these laws that are impossible. They really put them in favor. He says, no, it's actually like this. And he reorients scripture. He then goes in a specific address of warning for his disciples now and how we should live in Matthew chapter 6. And it begins with a strange word, a word of caution. It begins with beware. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 says this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now whenever you read these passages, it's really important to highlight key words. And what we see right here is righteousness, beware, and seen. Just highlight those. This is what the author is trying to communicate as important hinge points of this passage. Now, the term beware isn't used very often in the New Testament. You actually think it would be. It's actually not. It's only Jesus that really uses this. Paul uses it a few times, but he's always talking about bewaring of something. It's often the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, when Jesus uses this term beware, it means a state of alert, of high caution. I think the best picture to communicate the seriousness of in which Jesus is communicating, beware, is, did anybody ever ride in the front seat as a child in like a 1980s station wagon? You know what I'm talking about? Where you would, you would buckle in and you would ride and then there would be an abrupt stop and you would just fly forward. The only thing that would keep you safe was something called the mother's seatbelt. And it was this halted hand that would come and suffocate that child for a few minutes. You know what I'm talking about? That's the state of alert that Jesus is communicating. It's an alert. It's a caution that says, watch out. There's an accident ahead, and you have to quickly respond. I know. Again, just flatter me with, and humor me with laughter right now. Jesus says, beware. He says, be cautious. You have to take this seriously. This is not a light thing. And he goes on to communicate that this, this beware, this state of alert has to be taken place. And we see this term used a few times in the Gospels. We see it in Matthew 16 where he talks about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mark then says beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. He talks about beware, state of alert, and he uses another big theme, leaven. Or yeast. How many bread bakers out there? You've attempted. I know you have. It was COVID. You all attempted to make bread. At least once. I love these uh, people that have this pride in their sourdough making skills. Right now that came. And those that failed miserably. But he talks about living. He talks about yeast. Now, in our modern culture, I love making bread when I can eat it. Bread's amazing. It's, it smells amazing when you make it. It tastes amazing. It's glutinous. It's awesome. Unless you have a gluten allergy, like me. That I'm being healed of. Thank you, Brandon. But when you have this bread that's made, we have this yeast that takes over the dough. Yeast is a powerful process. Now, for us, we're used to the artificial yeast of modern day. Where you buy it in a small little package of Fleshman's yeast and it's perfectly measured. However, that's not the yeast that Jesus speaks of. And it wasn't until I watched this documentary cook that Pastor Bob recommended well, they talk about the bread-making process in the old country. And the bread-making process was different. He says they would take water, flour, and salt, and then they would let the lump sit outside. And as you're watching this documentary, he says, and the reason they did this is so that the wild yeast of the air would begin to work into the dough. And when I heard that, I instantly thought of this passage and thought, I get it. The religious spirit is not just something that's worked in. It's atmospheric. It's something that is caught. 
It's something that you breathe in. It's intoxicating and it's contagious. And Jesus says, again, be at a great state of alert. And I've seen this many times where people get saved, they witness the power of the Holy Spirit, and they get locked into a religious movement, and they begin to deny the power that very saved them and rescued them from the addiction that they struggled with. Got stories the other day of a guy that started to go and get his uh, professional PhD and is working on that, and has totally begun to deny the moves and the work of the Spirit that we had all witnessed together. This is troubling. Religious spirit is contagious. It has this illusion of growth, but it's growth in the wrong direction. You grow away from God rather than towards him. He says, have this state of alert, but it's not till we get to Luke that we understand what the leaven of the Pharisees is. And Luke says this, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Now, our modern term and definition of hypocrisy or hypocrite, we would say is someone that pretends. Someone that says they live a certain way and then turn the other way. But honestly, that definition is not historical. It's actually coming from what Jesus portrays here. Our modern definition of hypocrisy comes from Jesus' teachings. See, a hypocrite or hypocrisy in the Greek culture was a play actor or pretender. And what they would do is they would go before, and again, we don't have time for this today. There's two documents I've written online of both righteousness and hypocrisy in the historical usages. It's exhausting and it's scholarly. You can read it if you'd like more in-depth teaching on this. It's online. With that being said, we have these hypocrites that wear these masks. Literally, here's a picture of what one would look like. It's probably the most historical accurate. How eerie and creepy it is. So what they would do is they would go to the city center, they would don their mask, it says, and they would begin to recite lines and would receive alms for their performance. That's literally what they would do. And they would do this and they would get rewards and accolades. And it says this, and they would, the moment they donned the mask, they would play the role of the mask they wore. And what Jesus brilliantly does in this passage is he says, beware of those, those hypocrites that go out into the city streets and give their alms to be seen by many. Behold, that's their reward. He literally takes this play actor position and he imposes it on the Pharisee and embarrasses them before this giant gathering of people. That religious spirit is contagious, it's dangerous, and it ruins your relationship with God. And what he does, he says, they wear this mask, and the mask is called righteousness. They put on this mask, this role of righteousness, and what they do is communicate a broken righteousness that God's never intended us to live out. And what happens is we have this document called the Talmud. Here's a picture of what the Talmud would look like. It's the interpretations of the rabbis and the Pharisees of the day. And what they did is they took the Torah and they began to teach the Torah with all their definitions on how it should be lived. Here's just an image of what it would look like. Your modern Old Testament translated to English is approximately a thousand pages. The Torah, or this, that's the, you know, our Old Testament. The Talmud is nearly 3,000. 3,000 pages to interpret a 1,000 page document with restrictions and adherences. That's the religious spirit that Jesus is confronting. And one of the most misguided teachings they would have is that of righteousness. They believe that people fell into three categories. You had the holy righteous, meaning complete righteous. You had the unholy righteous, and you had the penitent. What was the difference? The holy righteous are those whose merits outweighed their transgressions. What were the merits? It was giving in the public offering. It was your Pomp and ceremony of your religious perfection. Another way was you were free from sickness. So your health determined your standing with God. It's a big problem. But then you have these unholy righteous that 
are really living. Their transgressions outweigh their merits. But then there's this massive group in the middle called the penitent, and they don't know if their merits or transgressions, which one is winning. Talk about a prison to live in. And you live in this place hoping that God would receive you, hoping that God would forgive you, hoping. That's the picture of the man that's beating his chest that Jesus refers to. He says, that's the one the Father sees. But this definition of righteousness is not even scriptural. See, what we find is that righteousness predates the law. Righteousness had to do with relationship. I would encourage you, if you're questioning that from a scholarly level, read the document that I put together. It has to refer to your relationship with God. Where do we see this? Genesis chapter 6. These are the generations of Noah. Behold, Noah was righteous before God because he walked with Yahweh. It has to do with your relationship. Secondly, we see the covenant. The righteousness had to do with covenantal relationship. We see this with Abraham. Where it says he walked with God. He was viewed as blameless and righteous. And then God, Yahweh, made a covenant with him. Jesus now makes a covenant with us. And he redefines what righteousness is in a relational way. Where yes, there are still Rules that relationship holds, but rules are not that which we worship. We worship the one we have relationship with. And what he does, he says, in order to understand this righteousness, in order to understand this relationship, you have to enter a place called the secret place. 